prime time local news serving the lakeland and midwest regions good evening and thanks for joining us over the weekend the smoky conditions continued to hover over lloyd minster along with the rest of alberta and saskatchewan connor chan has more on whether or not things will clear up in the coming days global news meteorologist peter quinlan joins us today and peter we know the smoke is still hovering over saskatchewan what are the radars showing when it comes to where the smoke is coming from in the province is that all from the saskatchewan fires or is it coming from parts of bc where exactly is the smoke coming from yeah, so we're getting into quite a mishmash of the smoke coming from various fires. We're seeing some of it coming from fires in northern Saskatchewan, some of it coming from fires as far away as Manitoba and even northern Ontario when we get into a bit of an easterly influence in parts of Saskatchewan. And then at times we get the fires, uh, smoke from the fires in parts of British Columbia and even the northern United States. So the expectation was to have the smoke cleared by you know Monday and do the signs point to the smoke sticking around or can we see it start to part ways as we are expected you know with rain coming in those next couple of days here. Yeah, I think the smoke is going to stick around the Lloyd Minster area. I kind of thought it would initially stick around actually right through the period, uh, maybe not to the extent that it is stuck around, but uh, really at this point, the Lloyd Minster area is kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place. We've got fires to the northeast in northern Saskatchewan, fires to the west in British Columbia, and then fires to the southeast in Manitoba. So really, whatever the wind direction, there is smoke coming in from fires in one area or another. So it likely will stay fairly smoky right through until Thursday, maybe Friday, when we may start to see that smoke get flushed out as we get into a change in wind direction. With that smoke blocking the sun and creating that overcast, how much of a role does that play in, into the daily highs for July? Yeah, so normally this time of year in the Lloyd Minster area, we see daytime highs around 24 degrees. And even just through the early portion of this week, we've seen those temperatures suppress significantly back into the teens throughout Monday. Uh, and that's because the sun's energy doesn't make it to the ground because it gets trapped by all the smoke that's in the air. Uh, so it is substantial. Like we had to back temperatures down about five to 10 degrees off of where uh, we were expecting them to be because of this smoke, which also makes forecasting quite difficult if we do see that smoke flush out we should see temperatures back into those mid-20s as we take you through the end of the week but uh, likely through Tuesday we'll see those temperatures stuck in the teens. And with just going back to something I said earlier there with the rain that is expected over the next couple of days you, will that help in any way in terms of the visibility by any chance? It may help just briefly, but this isn't major rain. We are expecting the potential for some thunderstorms over the next few late afternoon, evening hour periods. Uh, so that will help temporarily, but there is a steady inflow of smoke coming in from these areas, both aloft and even at the surface. So that's uh, any relief that we do see will be fairly short lived, at least in the short term. What is the general outlook for the summer? Are we going to be seeing more of those 30 plus degree heat waves that we saw? few weeks ago is that kind of the outlook or what is sort of the outlook for uh, the rest of July and heading into August? Yeah, we're going to see this heat sticking around quite a bit. We're going to see temperatures in the mid to upper 20s or even low 30s right through the rest of the month of July into August. We often get a number of 30 degree days as well in the Lloydminster area. So we'll see that stick around. It's going to be a very hot and dry finish to summer. Uh, usually the wettest months of the year are June and July in the Lloydminster area and we really haven't seen the normal amount of moisture we uh, would typically see in most areas. So it's going to get drier. We might even be talking about more fire startups. So you need to make sure you're being extra vigilant out there, uh, especially if you're camping or disposing of cigarette butts. Are there any reminders that you want to give to people that are watching and that may be you know, very concerned with their own, you know, well-being when it comes to these types of weather conditions. Yeah, so if you're experiencing difficulty breathing, if you have underlying heart or lung issues or problems, uh, you should avoid spending time outside doing strenuous activity. That's the advice uh, from health authorities and even the general population, even if you don't have those underlying conditions, you are advised if you're having difficulty breathing, don't be outside running around. Uh, you should try and take it easy outdoors, uh, try and be in indoor well ventilated areas because this can be difficult on the lungs, essentially your breathing in particulate matter. So it's not a good scenario and you are advised to try and stay in those well ventilated places and it's also quite hot sometimes so you also want to stay cool when you're out in the heat uh, seek air conditioning and cooler spaces during the day. Well Peter I really appreciate your insight and giving us a little bit of more detail on what we could expect over the next couple of days it's unfortunate that we have to wait till the end of the week for things to start to clear up but it's good to know that the end is in near sight so thank you. Yeah for sure thanks for having me Connor. 
There are 16 new cases of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan. Two of those are in the northwest zone, with none in the immediate Lloydminster area. 262 cases are active in the province. 55 people are in hospital with five in our zone. For the month of June, more than 80% of the new cases were in unvaccinated residents. More than 1.3 million vaccine doses have been administered, including over 83,000 in the northwest. The 2021 Lloydminster Exhibition Fair wrapped up on Saturday after a week of agricultural events. Jillian Code has the details. Smoky skies didn't deter fans from taking in the final day of the Lloydminster Exhibition Fair. A draft horse pull and team roping took center stage for Saturday's festivities. The ring was full of cowgirls and cowboys cheering each other on. Competitors came from all around to take part in the events. Everything was uh, kind of cancelled and that's why we came out here. Usually we have four or five shows to go to in like Manitoba each year, but uh, they've all been cancelled. So there was uh, two shows, actually three shows, Calgary Stampede, um, Lloyd Minister and then Vermilion. So we kind of did that little run. Plett and Anderson are from Verdon, Manitoba and came to Lloyd Minster with the Silver Oak Percherons draft horse team. They said they enjoyed being able to take in the entirety of the event. It's so much more fun. You, you're coming for a whole weekend instead of just one day, 30 seconds of a run, and then you get to meet all sorts of great people, and it's just fun time. While competitors are reacquainting themselves with the competitive scene, the animals are also facing a learning curve. It takes a bit of conditioning to get them back up so they can at least make some rounds around the arena so they don't just decide to stop because they're so out of breath. The pair says they've enjoyed their time in Alberta so far. Met new people and it's a lot of fun socializing once again. I thought it was a good time and it's good to be uh, with our family and friends and everything like that so uh, we really enjoyed it and it's great hospitality at, uh, in Alberta. Their team will head to the Vermilion Egg Society's Draft Horse Classic which runs Friday and Saturday this week. Jillian Code, Primetime Local News. It's time now for this week's Retrospect. Here's Blake Nath. This week in retrospect. Back in 91, no beach, no problem. Bonneville brings the sun and sand downtown. Bonneville's first annual beach bash looks as if it's on its way to becoming a classic summertime event. Bonneville's first annual beach bash just wouldn't be a party without lots of kids and lots of good fresh watermelon. Or the putting for prizes. Ah, robbed again. The dunk tank's a classic. And the skateboarders put up a terrific summer display with their platform acrobatics. Everything went basically according to plan. We didn't do so well in the volleyball games, maybe because some of us just couldn't keep our feet in the soft sand. Organizers brought in a ton of sand for this year's event. We are in the heart of the beaches. Uh, we have uh, lakes all around here. Moose Lake, Muriel Lake, uh, Wolf. And um, it's hard a lot of times to get your tourists to know that, you know, we're in the center of it and we're here and we're looking after the tourists. So we said, if you can't get out to the beach, we'll bring the beach to, to Bonneville. We did. And in 96, Lloydminster residents prepare for the Fringe Festival in hopes of raising the cultural profile of the border city. For three days in August, these downtown streets in Lloydminster will be transformed into the world of the Fringe. There's going to be lots of music, dance, and uh, mainly a Fringe festival is about drama. The Split City Fringe August 8th through 10th will be a small replica of the ones held in Edmonton and Saskatoon every summer. Four local entertainment groups, as well as acts from across Alberta and Saskatchewan, will converge on the border city for the event. We have... Uh, a comedian coming from Calgary, his name's Brian Stollery. We have uh, two shows coming from Edmonton. Uh, we have two comedians coming from, uh, from Saskatoon to do uh, different skits and songs. For many years, Lloydminster has been a city dominated by mainly sporting activities. Hockey in the winter, softball in the summer. But Border City residents starve for a taste of culture will find their hunger fulfilled here. When this room in the Atrium Centre is transformed into the heart of the Split City Fringe. I know that I'm starved for culture in Lloydminster. I think there is a lot of people 
wanting to uh, wanting to get out and see some some different cultural things. In the past, Lloyd has been very kind of sports orientated, but but uh, it's I think a time for a change. And that's all for this week in retrospect. Retrospect this week is brought to you by Webb's Ford. Worth your while to drive the extra mile. Webb's Ford in Vermilion. Now our Shelby Clark will take a first look at your Monday weather. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Now taking a first look at your weather forecast here, as you can see that we are looking at a high of 17, so not as warm as we'd like to see, but we are seeing a lot of those uh, store, uh, cloudy skies there with a lot more smoke in the air, so make sure you're staying safe out there, but we are seeing a little mix of some sun and cloud. Now moving into temperatures across central Alberta and Saskatchewan. On the Alberta side, Rocky Mountain House is at a high of 19, while Edson is at a high of 16, as well as Athabasca. Whitecourt is at 15, and Edmonton's a bit warmer at a high of 21. Red Deer's at 23, and Jasper is the warmest at a high of 28. Now on the Saskatchewan side here, Cold Lake is sitting at 16, while Meadow Lake and Prince Albert are at 17. Melford's a bit cooler at a high of 15, and Saskatoon and North Battleford are both at 18 degrees. But speaking of North Battleford overnight, they will be seeing uh, a high of 15 with a lot more cloudier skies, but tomorrow they will be picking up the pace and warming up a bit to a high of 26, but they will still be seeing cloudier skies and a lot more uh, smoky uh, air as well. Uh, now moving into North Battleford here. Um, we're, overnight they will be seeing a high of 15 with a lot more uh, clear skies there, but tomorrow they will be warming up to a high of 23 in a mix of some sun and cloud. Here in Lloydminster, we will be seeing a high of 16 overnight and tomorrow we'll be warming up as well to a high of 25, but we will be possibly seeing a, a chance of some thunder showers tomorrow and precipitation overnight into the morning. Now looking at our three-day forecast here, as you can see on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we'll be seeing a, a high of 24 on Tuesday with a high chance of some precipitation. Precipitation. Wednesday we'll be seeing a mix of some sun and cloud with a high of 29 and a low of uh, 16 and Thursday we'll be seeing a high of 27 and a low of 16 as well but as I was saying on Tuesday we will be seeing a high chance of some uh, uh, thunder showers and a high chance of some precipitation. That is all for a first look at your weather forecast. We'll have more news coming up after the break. After this past weekend, the Milwaukee Bucks are one win away from their first NBA championship since 1971. Bucks all-star Giannis Antetokounmpo has answered questions about his health through his play. Now the only question remaining is, can the Bucks finish the Phoenix Suns in Game 6? Evan Kenny joins me with more. I'm joined now with Evan Kenny, and today we are chatting about what might be the last game of the 2021 NBA season with the Bucks and Suns NBA Finals. Now the Bucks are now up 3-2 to two against the Suns with Saturday's action. And Evan, can you kind of just recap what we really saw Milwaukee do on Saturday? Yeah, Jasmine, it's been a huge turnaround for the Milwaukee Bucks, obviously. They started off this NBA Finals series down 2-0, but they've come back and they've taken three games in a row here. And Jasmine, I think the biggest thing coming out of these three victories is just Milwaukee was able to get one of these on the road, which actually is the first win in the NBA Finals uh, series here that has come on the road. So that's a huge turning point uh, when it comes to the Milwaukee Bucks. Now they're forcing the Phoenix Suns to try and do the same thing uh, on Tuesday night coming up here in Game 6 to try and force a Game 7. So that's very difficult, you know, not only going on the road and trying to compete, but also trying to win that game in, in a do-or-die situation. As well, Jasmine, you know, the reason they were able to push this uh, two game six and win three in a row here is because of the Milwaukee Bucks defense. Now, this team was built uh, with a defensive mind in mind. Now, uh, they've really turned up that system to a whole nother degree, and it starts with arguably their best defensive player. And yes, this is arguably because obviously they have Giannis Antetokounmpo on that roster, but Drew Holiday has absolutely gone off when it comes to this finals in these last three games uh, specifically. You know, he is on the duty of, car of guarding either Chris Paul or Devin Booker, two unbelievable offensive players. 
Now, in that time, you know, Chris Paul does not turn the ball over very often. He averages two or less turnovers per game throughout this entire playoff uh, run here for the Phoenix Suns, you know, uh, totaling up to 22 turnovers in total. Now, in these final series here, being guarded by Drew Holiday, he's at, or he's turned the ball over 18 times, which is just four less than, you know, those three rounds combined. So Drew Holiday has really picked it up, and he's led this team defensively here. And we've seen how much Drew Holiday has really shined. As you can see it in that last, one of those last plays in Game 5 where he took that ball from Devin Booker right and got that alley-oop with Giannis. Now that also shows maybe what the Suns need to do in these upcoming games. They can't rely on Devin Booker to carry their offense, and they need some of their bench players to step up. We need to see some more threes going in, and we need to actually see the shots going in. They might be attempted, but actually go in. And I think the Suns really need to start moving their offense a bit around a bit more Booker and Paul are being leaned on and maybe too much Booker hasn't had too much playoff experience and now being in the NBA finals yes he's dropped 40 points but maybe he needs to see his other players do some more action and get some more assists but coming up for this game six what do you think that the Bucks need to do to secure the win well, Jasmine, just touching on your point quickly, I think you were spot on right on the money there. You know, and just adding to that, the Phoenix Suns, their bench has been one of their strongest points, especially being able to come off the bench and play a little bit of a two-way game for those young players. They haven't been able to quite do that. You know, they're getting outscored, uh, you know, possibly 14 or so points uh, from those bench players. So those guys really need to step up. You're right, spread out that offense a little bit there. Uh, now for the Milwaukee Bucks, if they want to seal it out on Tuesday night, their big players need to show up. Obviously, Giannis Antetokounmpo, two-time uh, NBA MVP, could be the finals MVP moving forward here. He's going to continue on his tear, but it's those other two guys, you know, the Chris Middletons and the Drew Holidays for the Milwaukee Bucks who need to step up. In those first two games, each of those guys, I don't want to say they were lackluster, but they definitely weren't playing at their best, Jasmine. Now, after those first two games, they've really stepped up. Each of them is averaging seven more points at least uh, than they did in those first two games with Drew Holiday averaging 20 points in the past three games and Chris Middleton, 29. So they really need to come and compliment Giannis Antetokounmpo if they want that victory. And we've seen, as you mentioned, the Bucks defense quite amazingly throughout this postseason. And the Suns offense maybe needs to step up even further than what they have the few past games. But speaking of Giannis as finals MVP, I think a lot of people see him as the front runner right now if Milwaukee wins. But if the Suns come back, there is the decision, will it be Booker, will it be Paul? And I think a lot more people are leaning towards Booker just because he has dropped 40 plus points in multiple games and he has been consistent for Phoenix compared to Paul where he did have the one off game. But for right now, Giannis is the front runner, but you think even there could be a kind of a dark horse in this race? Yeah, Giannis is definitely leaps and bounds to put it put it on the lower side there he's definitely leaps and bounds ahead of most of the players in this series you're right Devin Booker obviously the guy can score like there's no tomorrow he's proved it over his short NBA career thus far and he's just continuing that in the playoffs so I think he's the front runner if Phoenix does come back and push this to a game seven uh, obviously Chris Paul like you mentioned you know he's had the odd off game but he's really taken a a bulk of carrying uh, this Phoenix Suns team to this point. But another guy for the Milwaukee Bucks, like you said, maybe a little bit of a dark horse in this race. Chris Middleton already mentioned him. He's really stepped up, especially, you know, dropping 29 points in that one game, that game one that Giannis Antetokounmpo uh, was injured. He's really stepping up and he's starting to take control and make some of those clutch shots. So I think there is the argument, uh, you know, seeing how these next couple of games possibly uh, go here for Chris Middleton to be the MVP. Well, it should be an interesting game no matter who wins on Tuesday night. And maybe we will be seeing a Game 7 on Thursday. Thank you so much, Evan Kenny. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine. Now we're Shelby Clark. We'll take another look at your weather forecast.
Thanks so much, Jazz. So now taking a second look at your weather forecast here, we're going to look at temperatures more across the region here. On the Alberta side, Edmonton is at a high of 20 in Vagreville, is at a high of 18 as well as in Wainwright, Marwain and Vermilion, and up in Lac La Biche are at a high of 17 degrees. Cold Lake is at 16 and Bonneville and St. Paul are at 22, while down in Provost is a lot warmer at a high of 28 degrees there. But now on the Saskatchewan side here, Isle of Cross is at 22 degrees as well as Meadow Lake, or Green, uh, Green Lake, sorry. Meadow Lake is at 17 while St. Walberg is at 20 degrees and Pierceland's a bit warmer at 23 degrees there. North Battleford's a little bit cooler at 19 degree mark there and Maidstone's at 24 Ma while Macklin is at 26 degrees. Now looking at our northern region here. On this side here, Grand Prairie is at a high of 17, while Peace River is at 18 degrees. High levels at 19, and Fort McMurray and Slave Lake are both at 16 degrees, and Fort Chippewan is at 20 degrees. Now on this side here, Uranium City and Stony Rapids are at 20 and 22 degrees. Wollaston Lake is a bit cooler at 17 degree mark. South End and Flin Flon are both at 21 and 20 degrees. In La Ronge, Buffalo Narrows and La Loche are a bit cooler at that 15 to 18 degree mark there. Now moving on into our uh, southern region, here. Over in uh, Yorkton is at 20 degrees while Moose Jaw is at 21. A little bit warmer over in Esteban at 26 degrees and Regina is at 23 while Swift Current and Kindersley are both at 17 and 18 degrees. Now on this side Coronation is a bit cooler at 22 degrees. Medicine Hat's at 20 and Banff is a lot warmer at that 27 degree mark but as you can see Calgary and Lethbridge are about that uh, same range there at 21 to 23. Now looking at temperatures overnight across the region as you can see that most places will be sitting at that 15 uh, degree mark there with a lot more cloudier skies but Murnham will be seeing a high chance of some thunderstorm clouds throughout the night. Meadow Lake's a bit cooler at 11 degrees and Paradise Hill will be sitting at 14 degrees. But moving into tomorrow across the region, We'll be seeing a lot warmer temperatures ranging from around 24 to uh, 26 degrees in most places. But Provost and Macklin will be sitting higher at that 29 and 31 degree mark there. So we will be seeing a little bit warmer temperatures tomorrow as well here in Lloydminster. Well, looking at our seven day forecast here, as I was saying earlier, uh, Tuesday we will be seeing some uh, thunder, uh, thunder clouds and um, a high chance of some precipitation on Tuesday with a lot more cloudier skies. Wednesday we will be seeing a 40% chance of some precipitation as well with a mix of some sun and cloud, but hopefully that rain will clear up some of the smoky uh, skies we've been seeing lately. Thursday we'll be seeing a high of 27 with a little mix of some sun and clouds as well. And Friday we'll be starting off this weekend with a high of 25 on Friday and Saturday with a little bit more sun and Sunday we'll be seeing a high of 27 while Monday we'll be uh, starting off next week with a high of 27 as well. That is a second look at your weather forecast. We'll have more news coming up after the break. I'm joined here now with Canadian author Christian Cameron. Now, you recently released your newest book, Artifact Space. So could you give some background into this book? The last thing my family did before COVID closed all the movie theaters. Remember back when we used to sit in movie theaters to watch movies? And um, so we all went out to see Little Women. We'd all read it. Um, and uh, literally, I was sitting in Little Women when virtually the entire sort of outline of artifact space came to me. Um, and if you know the book, there's a great scene where Amy, uh, in effect, says, uh, a boy says to her, like, you're a great artist. And she, she says, you know, the problem is I'm not a great artist. And you know what? That means that my options in life are to have some rich guy's babies. And somehow that scene tripped a whole idea of uh, of a science fiction world in which that wasn't all the options that Amy had. As you mentioned that you've had a lot of books in other genres. So is that what, what really brought you to think, okay, I want to do science fiction this time? So I've always loved science fiction. I read a fair amount of science fiction myself. And I, I don't think I'm being a great literati when I say science fiction is always actually about us, right? Like think of all those good Star Trek episodes and, and so on. It's, it's sort of like Black Mirror or any of those shows. It, it uses the future to ask questions about ourselves. So it's a great genre for that. And um, I, was, uh, I was living in Canada during Donald Trump's America, thinking thoughts about capitalism and misogyny and feminism and that kind of thought. 
Um, and I decided science fiction was a better vehicle than my other genres to, to discuss those while also maybe being more hopeful than cynical. And this book will actually be a part of your new series. So without giving too much away, what can readers expect? At the heart of Artifact Space is a sort of genocidal murder mystery. And I, it's a tiny spoiler, but running through are clues that people, humans, have found these sort of archaeological remains of another race that has clearly been dead for a very long time. And as the clues begin to mount up, the protag it's not, it doesn't seem to be what the book is about, but as they voyage further and look at more, they sort of pick up more clues that maybe this has directly to do with an alien race that humans are in con contact with. And that is super scary. And the series is about solving that mystery. But at another level, the main character, um, Mark Barrow, is a young woman who, for whom almost nothing has gone right in her life. And when she joins the merchant service, the merchant marine, um, it's sort of an arc about her and it's the reverse arc of Joe in Little Women. In Little Women, Joe, I'm being super literary. I don't have a PhD in, in English, but I'm gonna lay this out the way I see it. In, in Little Women, Joe has an incredibly strong, happy family life. And a lot of the novel to me is about Joe finding out who she is and what she wants to do. And Marka and Barrow has no family. She's grown up in a horrible orphanage. And she's very strong in herself as you have to be to be a survivor, but she has very little trust for other people. So in a reverse Joe, she starts out knowing herself and she has to learn to trust other people. And if anyone is looking to get the book or even check out any of your other works, where is the best place to go? Uh, every one of them is available on Amazon, on uh, Barnes & Noble, on Indigo. I, I've, I've reached a level of prominence that I think my book is available pretty much everywhere. Um, it won't be in U.S. and Canadian bookstores, I think, until September 23rd. But you can buy it right now on Kindle, on iTunes, you know, all the usual suspects for uh, electronic books. And um, uh, bookstores will have it after the 23rd. It's available in the U.K. and Australia right now. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Christian. Thank you. I'm joined here with Rich Davis, author of the new comic book phenomenon called The Cult of Dracula. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's amazing to be here with you. Now, how many issues are involved in the Cult of Dracula series? So Cult of Dracula is part of a three volume saga that's broken up into three volumes of six issues each. So Cult of Dracula is six issues. Um, and then in 2022, we'll be following that with Rise of Dracula, which will be another six issues. Um, and then in 2023, we'll be following that with a final volume called Reign of Dracula, which is also six issues. Um, and we're working on possibly doing a couple of one shots that kind of give more background information about some of the characters that people have um, kind of gravitated toward and have become really popular. Um, the Dracula's Brides will probably get their own one shots. So the original 18 issues could stretch out into 21. Um, but I, I really don't see it going much further than that because you know, I, I have a specific story that I want to tell, and it's a very rich universe, and you could tell a lot of stories in it, but I don't want to drag it out too long. I'd rather cut it off a couple of issues too early than drag it out one issue too long. What can fans all expect in this series? I What I can confidently say is no matter how well you know Bram Stoker's uh, classic Tale of Terror, you have no idea where Cult of Dracula is going to take you. Um, we start with a very small, simple premise. Um, there's an investigator from the FBI who has been tasked to investigate this terrible event that they're calling the Cult of Dracula mass suicide. So it's kind of like a Jonestown um, or a Waco, Texas type thing where uh, the media is saying that uh, these these cultists have killed themselves. It becomes very evident once um, Agent Brom arrives 
that this was not a suicide. Something terrible happened here and people are trying to cover it up. So it starts out very simple, true crime story. And from there, the further you go into the story, it kind of spirals into this um, exploration of a cult that's been around for thousands of years, worshiping an ancient blood goddess. So we get to find out a whole lot about the way the cult functions and um, their different incarnations throughout uh, history. And then the, as we keep going down the spiral, um, it broadens even more and we start to discover an entirely new vampire mythology. How would you say support has been with this new comic book compared to your first books that were released in previous years? It has been overwhelmingly successful. Um, when I started shopping this book back in uh, late 2019, uh, I, I was fully convinced that I was going to go the Kickstarter route and I would be lucky if I sold five copies. You know, I knew my buy three of them, so I just needed to sell two more. Um, and uh, so we, I ended up, uh, we released the book through a small publisher called Second Sight Publishing. And um, sales were overwhelming. Uh, we sold more, in excess of 10,000 units of issue number one, which for an independent comic book that uh, from a writer that no one's ever heard of, those are, those are killer numbers. Um, and the book was actually so successful in that first issue that the publisher couldn't afford to continue publishing it because the print orders were just too large for them. So from there, we were able to shop it to uh, a few more publishers, and uh, ultimately we ended up with SourcePoint Press, which I think has been the absolute best move we could have possibly made. Uh, we're closing in on um, about 125,000 units sold now, um, and uh, we're only up to issue four. Um, so uh, it is Cult of Dracula. It began as kind of a cult underground uh, horror hit that if you knew about it, you were cool. And if you didn't know about it, well, maybe somebody will tell you about it someday. To now it's become one of the best selling independent comic books on the market. And we're, um, you know, we're outselling some Marvel and DC books, which is, is huge. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, the response has been incredible. Retailers have really gotten behind it. Um, fans and readers are picking it up and they love it. Um, collectors are investing in it. So it's really, it's hitting, hitting all the demographics in the comic book hobby. So, um, I'm, I'm still blown away by the fact that it's doing so well, but, uh, but it, it really is. It's, it's really, really kicking some butt. For people wondering that may not have read the Cult of Dracula series, where can they access this comic book series? Is this available in comic book stores right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's in comic book stores all over the world. Um, we have, um, I, I think, somewhere around 50 stores in Canada are carrying it. Um, hundreds of stores in the United States are carrying it. Um, we're, uh, we're on shelves in the UK and Ireland and uh, Croatia, Japan. Uh, we're all over the world. Um, so um, please find a local comic book shop near you and support them first because the local comic book shop market is the absolute backbone of what we're able to do. Um, you know, your local comic book shop, they are the, they're the key to finding those cool, interesting things that don't have billion dollar movie franchises behind them yet. So go to your local comic book shop. If you don't have one or if your local comic book shop isn't carrying it, um, you can find us on Amazon. Um, uh, multiple online stores have it. Uh, and if you like to read your comics digitally, you can go to Comixology and um, you can buy the book through uh, digitally that way. So there's all kinds of ways to find a copy. Perfect. Well, thanks again so much for joining me today, Rich. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. 